So we'll just consider this a, an informal fireside chat. And in fact, that'll work well too, because that means that as we go along, feel free to go ahead and interrupt me if you have any questions. Just stop me and I'll try to answer them. Um, and that way you'll go ahead and keep me from getting into long drawn out war stories or any of the other things that can happen if I, if I stay too, uh, too wrapped up in all this on my own. Okay, Dale Carnegie once said that before you can speak about anything, there are two things you have to establish. One is what it is you're going to say, and secondly, why it is that you're capable of speaking on this subject, essentially establishing your credentials, which is why we're going to fly right to that section. So I'm going to talk about ideas. I'm not going to talk about tools. Uh, this is not a, a discussion about how to secure your server uh, to protect against the latest um, WordPress attack. This is not about any specific tool. There's a, uh, there's a piece of wisdom I received once a long time ago that said that masters are concerned about the work and apprentices are concerned about their tools. So since someday I'd like to be a master of these things, I'm going to go ahead and stay focused on the work itself and on the ideas. The first idea that I really want to bring home is that social media is vital to profitability. I know that I'm speaking to the choir here, but in a lot of cases there may not be enough information to bring back to your companies. I know a lot of other people are going to be speaking with charts, tables, and all sorts of information to, to arm yourselves so that you can go back and talk about that. Um, but I'm going to try to focus instead on the idea of information space. That is that around each person and around each business and around each entity, whether it be a corporation or anything else, there's this information space that surrounds it. And in part, social media is the current tool that we use to let us share and expose our information space to one another so that we can work with each other. As a result, because we're sharing this information, we're also increasing risk to the organization, to the individual. Lots and lots of horror stories. I won't go into a lot of them. Some of them I've lived, um, and I may touch on those in the war stories. But the idea that we have to share information in order to be functional as people and as businesses, but the very act of doing so increases the innate risk that we carry. So we have to find ways to either reduce that risk or learn to accept it or learn how to work within it. So knowing these things are going to help us a lot. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit, because this is the profitability section, I'll try to speak on things that we can do, things that you can take away to protect your business. Now, there's not going to be a lot of new stuff here. I'm going to talk, in fact, I can basically vigilance and education. These are your defenses. Nothing new there. I am hoping, though, that with some of the ideas I want to talk about, to maybe reframe how you look at these ideas for vigilance and defense. Now, as for myself, I can speak on these things because I have a very deep and very thorough background in deception. Um, at 15 years old, I needed money. My dad said, get a job. I went to the mall. I couldn't get a job. But there was a carnival there. And I made a lot of money, and I decided to stay with the carnival. And probably should have let my parents know, but I came home about a week later, and we had a lot of fun getting back together. <coughs> <laughs> and, I, and I met law enforcement for the first time, who I got to work with many times later in my career. <laughs> later, using the background of some of the things that I had done as a hobby as, when I was younger, as well as some of the things that I learned in the carnival, because the carnival was full of wonderful lessons like, I can take this guy for over $100 if I let this little girl beat him and give her $20 worth of stuff off my walls. Because I could get him engaged in it. One of the first things I was taught in the carnival was piss them off. Get them angry at you. And then take that anger 
and transfer it to those three little milk bottles that they just can't knock down. You know, they wouldn't have a problem if they were just good enough, strong enough, viral enough to knock down those milk bottles. So coming back and leveraging that background um, and those early lessons in deception, I went ahead and became a professional magician working in the old Playboy Club in the French Quarter, also at 15. Um, and I did so because I lied. I told them I was 23. I knew people would lie about 18 and 21, but I feared no one lies about being 23. <laughs> and as a result, I was never asked for an ID, I was never asked for any identification, and I got my first start working as a magician. And magic is, one definition of magic uh, that I really enjoy is it's the principles and practices of deception for the purposes of entertainment. And as it turns out, I got to leverage a lot of this background in other projects. When I started defending nuclear weapons facilities, I used my background in deception. If you try to do anything logical in that environment and you break in, we'll catch you, because everything's a little backwards. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Sneakers, without Redford, I like to tell my clients I'm a lot like Robert Redford with just more girth. Um, <laughs> I used to lead a team and I used to work in the business of penetration assessments. That is to say that I would break into businesses at their request and then document how we broke in so that we could train their employees better. And I did that in part over the web through applications and through internet-based attacks and I did that in part through social engineering. I would actually walk in and talk my way into my own office behind the firewall connect and see what I could steal. Or I would go through and just lie and walk through a business um, and, uh, and try to gain information from specific systems or targets. Um, I know that, in fact, it was this background specifically is why I'm here and getting a chance to share this with you. Uh, apparently some of the stories I've told over beers have uh, gotten around. Um, my business cards say that I'm a technologist, a photographer, a naturalist, and a thinker. And that's because somehow I've got to be both James Crossman and I've got to deal with all these different parts of myself. But specifically in the technologist area, this is what I can talk to. And I know a lot of people here have known me as just a, a fellow geek at NetSquared or at the geek gatherings or have seen my photography. But my primary background has been a technologist. I actually walked into a computer store needing a job in 1981, so 30 years ago. And I've been working with computers ever since then. I started connecting people together back in 1983 when the ArcNet chipset first came together. And I became fascinated by the fact that I could do something in this room on my computer, and you could see it on your screen over there. And a lot of what I've seen develop and a lot of the ideas I've started there, we now call social media. A lot of times it started back then beforehand, um, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't quite use those names. I have designed secured networks for a variety of corporations, um, for law enforcement agencies, and uh, even a couple of Department of uh, Energy nuclear facilities. In 1996, I switched over and started working in information security specifically because those were the days when it was fun. And it was profitable. I could walk into anyone's business and I could say, let me show you something. I sit down at their browser and in a couple seconds I could say, this is the root of your web server. These are all your files. Watch what happens when I change this file. And then I could get business and it was great. But then in 2001 came the US-Chinese hacking war and then later 9-11. And somewhere in the middle of this, we had started a company called Vericenter, which later became the hosting provider for FBI.gov, NASA.gov, and I was the information security officer. So I went ahead and got my CISSP back in 2001. Um, as a result of operating these type of systems, I was what's called a blue team leader. I worked on the blue team. So in war games over information security with hackers, there's usually a red team and a blue team if you're in the military. A blue team is the one the sneaker teams come after. The red teams are also called sneaker teams. Um, so I'm used to having Navy SEALs climbing through my ventilation duct work at my facility, trying to break into my data center while I'm trying to catch them, um, 
or trying to pin down where they are. It was a lot of fun. Um, but it also gave me a chance to work with some of the best hackers in the world for when they would try to attack the systems that we hosted. So one of the things I got used to doing was throwing a computer out there that was defenseless. So they would promptly take it over and use it as a place to stage their attacks from. And they'd put all their good, brand new special hacking tools on it. So after a day or so of the war games, depending on how long we'd go, I'd just go and unplug it and take the computer away. And that's how I built my library of hacking tools. Um, when I left this business, I went ahead and became a red team leader. So that's when I started working on the penetration assessment side. I started breaking into companies over the internet, and then one day I was called and was told our social engineer wasn't there. Could I please go ahead and do a social engineering gig? It was okay if I got caught, because in this particular case, we had failed the client a year earlier, and the client had spent the entire year practicing, learning how to defend themselves against social engineering. So it was expected that I would get caught. By 1.30 in the afternoon, I had my own office. I had my own connection to, the, to their network behind the firewall. And I had my own pass card to get me into the different floors of the building. So uh, at that point, I tended to get a lot more assessments. I was also the, the former chair for a while. InfraGuard is, an, is a joint operation between commercial entities and the FBI. And for a while, I used to lead the, uh, the incident response team. Uh, for the Houston area until the FBI decided that there was just too much liability involved and they didn't want to be in that game anymore. Um, within social media, I've been active since the 1980s. I met the mother of my children in the 80s online. I dated my first murderess online in the 80s. Those two stories are actually connected, but they're not the same person. I, I sort of broke up with the murderess over the phone in order to go out with the woman I later married. And then she murdered the guy she dated right after me. So that she met online. Uh, the murderers, not my, my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, yeah, my, my, my ex-wife, yes, I bro we broke up in person. Um, I was a, a CompuServe for Sysop in order to establish some geek cred. I don't even know if people recognize that name anymore. And I started working in the virtual teaming space in 1993 and had IBM underwrite my home laboratory for a while because I led the uh, virtual team of network professionals for the NPA before it died. Um, in, a, in addition, in my personal experience, I, I went through Hurricane Ike in social media. Um, and I got to hear on the radio about all these people who were alone and afraid when I finally got bored and turned on the radio. And I didn't have that experience because I was connected with everyone else via Twitter. And a lot of people don't realize it, but the fact that Twitter is based on text messaging or SMS communications, that is much more reliable in the event of an emergency than telephones. So throughout the entire Ike incident, we were able to stay connected with who had electricity, who needed situations. I had people contacting me via Twitter to check on my neighbors who were their family who found me via Twitter. Um, in addition, my, my daughter, um, I met her mom online. I wanted her raised to take advantage of this new social endeavor. And so in her playpen, she had a 122 key keyboard opposite her busy box. And I thought it was just wonderful that when she was nine years old, I found my HTML reference books in her room. Then I started finding books like Hacking Exposed, How to Hack Windows, How to Hack Linux, showing up in her room as well. And it led to a lot of uh, red team versus blue team in the house. Uh, but in her case, she actually also ended up running away into Houston, fifth largest city in the United States at the time, uh, through Twitter, Facebook, and other social media outlets. People would stop her almost every day and say, are you Victoria? You should call your dad. He loves you. Um, and then finally, uh, and, and she is back, she's three years sober, and I'm going to be a grandfather soon. Um, so it was a very happy ending. And then finally, uh, for a while with my last company, I decided to see whether or not I could sell mattresses online via Twitter. And I was successful enough that that company, who was a mattress reseller, ended up creating an online store to capitalize on it. 
I'm also the guy who thinks that this is brilliant. There was a there was a, a joke Facebook site not long ago that had uh, the storyline of someone saying, or it was, it, was a, it was a screenshot of someone's Facebook account that said, I just survived my first earthquake. They're going to evacuate the building now. <laughs> so this was someone that before they evacuated, they had to update their Facebook. Now, for a while I was responsible for human lives as well as information security. And so I think this is brilliant. I know that the person who took this photograph told me he thought it was a joke. But if you don't have a sign like this, get one, because this is the kind of thing that people will look at, laugh at, and then if there's a fire, they'll remember it. So enough about me, social media. Let's talk about the newosphere. This is, this is an idea that I came across in the 80s. Um, it was originally written about by uh, Deschardins, and he was, for a long time, the de facto uh, patron saint of the internet before the Catholic Church got together and found a proper patron saint of the internet. internet. Uh, Deschardins was a geologist, he was a paleontologist, he was a philosopher and a Jesuit priest. A lot of his writings are still under wraps and have not been released. Um, at one point, the church decided to censor him a little further, and so they said, we're just gonna send you away where you won't be a problem anymore. Go to China. You won't be a problem in China. So he was at ground zero when the Peking man was found, and that continued a lot of his research. But uh, Chardin thought that the newosphere was the, the next part of evolution, that it, planets start with a geosphere. There's a planet, a rock. After that, the biosphere begins to develop around it. Life develops. And then finally, the noosphere. This idea that we have a, um, a, a, a region of collective human thought, invention, and spiritual seeking. And that this forms natively around us as we develop, as we mature, and as we evolve. And that Chardin went ahead and predicted that this would continue to get organized and that we would be better at it and how we shared our experiences, how we shared our thoughts and how we shared our, our spiritual seeking. And if this doesn't sound like the description of what social media has become, I don't know what is. The, the idea of the noosphere was that it, it came about and it's been evolving all along with us. That would make social media just the latest tool for how we interact with the noosphere, how we are part of it. Um, there's some very interesting ideas. Um, similar to the noosphere is this idea of information space around it. I'll probably slip and call it info space a few times. I try not to because that's now a company um, and a commercial entity, but it's still just the idea that, that around all of us is, are the, is, this is this information area information about myself, information about my business, what it is I'm doing, my secrets, where I'm going, what business I'm after, what I'm going to bid for this proposal. And if that information is communicated incorrectly, then I'm at risk. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that several years ago, a document was published called the Clue Train Manifesto. And I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with it or not. Um, it was revolutionary at the time, and, and I don't hear a lot talked about it much anymore. So I borrowed parts of it for this because this is the second idea to help you understand social media. Uh, this is from the preamble, and it is that a powerful global conversation has begun. Through the internet, people are discovering and inventing new ways to share relevant knowledge with blinding speed. As a direct result, markets are getting smarter. And they're getting smarter faster than most companies. Now this is the area and this is the purview of social media. Because the first three theses of the Clue Train Manifesto is that markets are conversations. And conversations are how neospherical entities or people or organizations communicate. That the markets consist of human beings and not demographic sectors. That conversations among human beings sound human. They're conducted in a human voice. It's not marketing speak. It's not happy speak. 
It's not corporate speak. The summary of the Clue Train Manifesto is that every organization has only two choices. One is either to lock yourself behind facile corporate words and happy talk brochures, and the other is to join the conversation. Now, there's going to be a lot of advice on how you can join the conversation. Um, but if you think of the conversation as taking place where these two forces are interacting, this is not um, a new technology. This is a natural evolutionary force um, driving us to interact more with each other. Um, and it's been interesting because I've tried to carry the Clue Train Manifesto into corporate America, into the companies that I've worked for. And it doesn't work because it is diametrically opposed to traditional market, market thinking. Um, look how many uh, Twitter accounts are in the names of companies rather than in the names of the individuals. I don't want to talk to IBM. I'd rather talk to Jeff at IBM, even if he's a peon, because chances are he knows something or he can get something done. Um, social media is being rapidly adopted, and there's a very real lack of understanding within our organizations about it. Um, some of the threats of social media, and some of these are just catch-alls, uh, common password usage. How many people here have a Twitter account? How many of us have uh, Flickr or script? How many of us use the same passwords? That's good. It's very good. I use it because I actually have a tiered approach of passwords. And um, depending on, on the, the security level, the password gets it. When it gets to banks or my website or anything like that, those passwords are never shared between anything else. That keeps it simple. Um, we love stories. We like to tell stories. We like to receive the attention that comes from stories. Your rapt attention, the fact that y'all are hanging on my every word, this is good stuff. Um, and we like to hear stories. We tend to simplify things in our lives, such as passwords. Um, if you've looked at, at uh, HC's attack against Twitter, that entire attack went down, and I'll go into it in a little more depth. It went down because users use the same passwords within the ecosystem of the web. From one, one social media entity to another, to another, they use the same passwords. In, in this case, um, a Gmail account. Um, privacy and confidentiality is part of our threats. In information security, we learned that the idea of information security is, is uh, three separate items, also referred to as CIA. It is the confidentiality of the information, it is the integrity of the information, and it is the availability of the information. And if those three things are, are compromised, then we have uh, a, a breach of information security. Protecting those things are important. Confidentiality of, of our information space is what we also consider privacy. Um, saw a neat poster the other day that, that uh, has a picture of a person in a shower with a webcam pointed at it and says, privacy helps us keep our, keep our dignity. That was rather clever. And our integrity is at risk if our privacy is compromised, if our information space is, is violated. But social media also lets us tell our own stories. So we get a chance to say what we do. We get to share what our organizations are doing better than anybody else. And these stories get to be told by people who know the stories better than anyone else, who are uniquely qualified to tell them. I remember when internet email was a big thing and companies fought it. What a waste of time, but we don't think of any organization today as being very viable unless they have some sort of, e of internet email, any ability to communicate with other organizations. And social media is that new ability to communicate with other organizations. A lot of companies tried to prohibit internet email when it first came out, just like a lot of companies are trying to prohibit social media. The idea isn't prohibit the idea is learn how to manage it. And then social media connects the information spaces between ourselves, our organizations, and those within our organization. Now social engineering, on the other hand, uses that same idea, social, the same need to connect with each other, but we engineer it to take advantage of people, to leverage deception, and so on to, uh, to, to attack. Um, 
one of the big one of the big uh, movements in social engineering right now is this concept of spear phishing. I know a lot of y'all have seen the eBay notices that says your password's changed, um, or from PayPal, uh, please log in and update your password. And that's a, that's a standard phishing attack. Um, when uh, when we bought a hosting facility that was operated by a very large manufacturer here in Texas earlier, um, we had a problem because their facility had been designed improperly, and as a result, when we bought it, there were two rival uh, organized crime entities that were using it as basis to attack phishing attacks from, and then they would raid each other's servers to steal all the credit cards that the other organization had stolen. And um, and it was a nightmare to try to, to try to solve and get through it. Um, another part of, of what's happening with social engineering is that we have this ecosystem of the web. The, when the web was originally created, trust was built into it. It was inherent in it. Um, there's a de facto uh, trust relationship between entities in the environment. Almost everything within the current ecosystem uses identity because after all the basic rule of security is who do you trust? And to establish who you are, almost everyone uses two things, an email address and a password. How many people have multiple email addresses they also use to manage their security? Uh, personally, I'm, I, I started it to stop spam and I'm having trouble remembering sometimes so now I get two emails from everybody. The one I created just for them to manage spam and the one I use my main email later. Sure. How do you feel about services like OnePassword? Um, I think there's I think there's value and I think there's risk. Uh, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So how well are you managing it, or how well are they managing your information? Because uh, you're putting the keys. Do you trust these people to the keys to your home? And I don't know how many people are familiar with that service. Well, and and. And there's there's a variety of services like it. There's uh, even within corporations, we we deal with uh, single sign-on solutions on a regular basis. It's all about managing who are you. Now, what is nice is it is it breaks down this whole idea of common passwords. But if I can get to it, well, now I've opened up everything. Um, and then, of course, part of the current ecosystem is all of these sites have a mechanism to allow us to remember who we are. Going back to that attack by HC against Twitter, the, the mechanism he used was specifically um, Gmail's, I forgot my password. In that, in that case, when you said, I, forget my, I forgot my password, when he got someone's ID and had their email, it came back and said, oh, I've sent a copy of your password to first initial blank, at hblank.com. So he thought, oh, I wonder if he means Hotmail. And if he's a Gmail user, then chances are he's abandoned his Hotmail account, and Hotmail actually purges their mail accounts on a regular basis. So he went over and registered a Hotmail account in that guy's name. And he went and did it again. And he got the Gmail account of this particular user emailed to his new falsely created Hotmail account, and he started going through his Gmail. And in one of the emails, he found a, thank you for signing up for our new service. Your ID is X, your password is Y. <laughs> and it was the same as his Gmail. So here's another example of someone simplifying their password use. So Hacker Crawl used that to break into, to, to start his attack in, in Twitter. That's how he gained access within Twitter for those users and was able to get access to the 130 some odd sensitive uh, twitter.com documents that he was then passing around on the internet because he was angry at them. Um, and so within an attack, there tends to be um, a few specific phases. Uh, the phases that, that I use and go through a lot and that most people do, you can usually see a reconnaissance phase, the development of the attack, and then the actual execution of the attack. Um, under reconnaissance, there's search engines. Um, I don't need to tell you who's probably best for this, um, but there's a fascinating book out there called Google Hacking. Um, because what 
this one gentleman did was he went out and discovered that you could type in that Google tends to, to create error messages. And specifically, Google will often stumble across vulnerable systems. So he discovered that if you put in error messages, that it would pop, bring up lists of systems that were there. In fact, there are some very nice tools that let me go ahead and say, I'm targeting this domain, run every known Google attack against it, and it'll pull every one of these queries in Google targeted against that domain so that I can see, oh, they've got a vulnerable SQL engine. Oh, they've, I can probably get in through a SQL injection attack. Um, because search engines are part of who manages and carries our information space today. All the information being cached, uh, all of our old historical records. I was very surprised when in the later years of the company, after we were hosting FBI.gov and NASA.gov, that someone found an, an email that I had written to a forum where I said, oh, we found a way to manage our farms of web servers and look for, for evidence of compromise by using the database of all the files that we backed up because some of the worms created specific files. So I mentioned the US-Chinese hacking war. That's notable because um, the, uh, the Code Red worm actually came out of that war and Code Red version 2 specifically. Um, and Code Red version 2 left a specific artifact that we could then search for and we could identify all the, all the servers where the people who were supposed to be running them didn't patch their servers and had become compromised. Um, this led to a write-up about how we were so insecure we were having compromised systems. But in most cases, if there's a tool that looks for something, chances are that organization doesn't have it. We were, we were impacted less by worms, by viruses, by other attacks than almost any other uh, competitor of ours because we had these tools. But also because of that, we became later, uh, these, this evidence was used against us in an attack against our credibility. And they went out and found old forum postings of mine. Um, social media, looking for the blogs of the people who are involved. Uh, right now, Google has talked about a targeted series of attacks against US and South Korean um, senior government officials going on by China um, where they're doing specific uh, spear phishing attacks because they're learning about who these people are and then they're posing as themselves. And we'll go into spear phishing in just a minute. Um, but again, the idea of, of leveraging social media outlets, blogs, and so on to find out about people. Because if I want to pose as your friend, I need to know about what's going on. If I want to break into your company, I need to know something about who works there, what y'all do. Um, especially if you're a branch office and you have a headquarters somewhere else because <laughs> obviously headquarters has given me the crap job of coming out to your site and having to inspect your security. Could you go ahead and log into that server please so that I know that it works? I need to videotape it for evidence so I can take it back and show those jerks back at headquarters. Type slowly. Um, there's actually a, a famous attack that used that approach. They went through and um, posed as uh, a film crew um, from the local university doing a, an expose on security and as they walked through the business they just kept their cameras on and they'd sweep over desks and then later go back frame by frame and look for papers left on the desks and they'd videotape that, they'd ask people to log into systems um, for them while they videotaped them. Um, then you need to develop the attack. People are always the weakest link within an organization. I can build a technical control that will stop everybody who tries this approach. None of those things will help if someone will open the door for me. When I did social engineering penetration assessments, part of our rules of engagement were, I won't pick a lock. If a door is locked, I won't go through it. Unless I can have someone open it for me. Or have them open it for themselves, walk off, and then I'll just stick my foot in the door, wait till they leave the area, and then I'll walk through it. Um, I usually will build a profile of anyone that I'm going to target. Um, I need to know who they are. I need to know what their roles are within the organization. Um, what email addresses do they use? Where are they coming from? What city and state do they live in? Where else do they tend to travel and work from? Um, what are their interests? After all, 
You know that guy that you've been arguing with online for the past year in that other forum? <laughs> it's me. I'm that guy. Remember when I said this? See, now you know it's me. Um, so finally you go out and you actually execute the attack against the organization or against the individual. Um, spear phishing. I already mentioned the, uh, the, the use from China against Gmail accounts for the US and, and South Korean officials. Um, this is a fairly recent development, but it's, it's not uncommon. Once they can get this information, see, phishing didn't work as a broadband attack because it became spam. All of us know, I hope, that if you get an email from, from PayPal saying, would you please log in and take a look at this, you know not to. But there was a compromise recently, uh, again, by a Chinese hacker against a, uh, a member of the Defense Department. And in this case, it was an email saying, hey, Bob, how was fishing last weekend? By the way, here's a list of all the spare military surplus stuff that we're looking for. Do you have any of this that we can buy? And it had a spreadsheet attached. So Bob went ahead and clicked on the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet launched a macro. He executed the macro. The macro compromised the system, and they were in. That's spear phishing. Because it was targeted against a specific individual, and one email was sent to that one individual, unlike a traditional phishing attack, there was no spam filter. There was nothing that raised everyone's awareness that this particular attack was going on. This wasn't a broad, let me see how many credit cards I could get. This was a specific, I know this person. I know what they like. I know what they do. I know who they are online. I'm going to go ahead and see what I can get out of them. Um, of course, I also like phone calls. Um, one, um, one of my, one of my favorite, best, most successful, whatever word would apply the best, attack I used against a, a different bank was uh, part of the target list I received were, these are all of our top tellers. Go ahead, see who you can get, it, who you can get information from. So these are the people with the most seniority, these are the people with the most training, and I figured these are people the problem, the people that were probably work the hardest. So I called them. Hi, my name is uh, whatever, Paul Alexander, and I'm from the Crossmage uh, Human Resources uh, Consulting Group. And we were contacted by the bank to see whether or not we would conduct a uh, survey to see whether or not there's interest in a flex time approach. And I found this great flex time survey. It asked all sorts of questions like, did you take any time off this past year because of burnout? What do you think of your commute every day? Do you like traffic? And there were these great conversation starters in these questions. And I'd sit there for 30 minutes with each person and go through this survey. And then when I was done, I'd say, you know, here at Cross Mage Human Resources, we, uh, we believe that security is important and we want to protect your privacy. So if we want to talk to you about this later, could we get an ID and a password that we could use so that we could verify it's you before we talk about these things? Now, I had an 80% result from that survey. 80% of those tellers, when I sat back down and got into the, an internal system, I could use the, that ID and that password, and I had full access to the system. Now, this is nothing new. Mitnick used this attack years ago. In fact, that's where I originally read about it. He went dumpster diving, pulled up a corporate phone list that had home addresses on it. So he sent out cards and said, hi, you have won this wonderful vacation. Please send an ID and a password and your information so that we can make sure it's you. And that's how he got in. I don't know, um, his technical skills weren't great, but he was a brilliant, brilliant uh, social engineer. Uh, Kevin Mitnick was, or is. Um, oddly enough, he also had a background in magic and being a magician. Um, we talked about targeted emails and the value there. Because they're not broadband, they're not going out to multiple people, there's no chance of them triggering a spam filter or anything like that. I would also make friends. I can't tell you how many times I'd go through a, a debriefing after a successful attack against an organization 
and I would hear things like, but he was so polite. He was so nice. And in fact, it was funny, there was a university where that was IT's response. He said, when have we ever hired polite and nice people? That should have been the very first thing that tipped you off. So I would make friends in companies. Um, if I had to break into a company right now with no warning or anything else, I'm gonna go see if I can get to one of their restrooms on one of their, on one of their floors. I'm gonna go sit in a stall and I'm gonna wait until someone else comes in. Then I'm gonna time leaving the stall at the same time so that we're washing our hands next to each other and start talking about the game last night. And we'll just chat each other up and make new friends as we walk down the hallway and I'll see whether or not he opens the door for me. A lot of times he will. If not, I walk past the door, I let him go in and then I run back and I stick my foot in the door and wait till he leaves. Um, it was actually funny, I had a, I had a client send me a video of me actually doing that, <laughs> that they found months after the assessment where they were going through their footage in one of the hallway uh, video cameras. And there's me walking past the guy as he goes in the secured door, and then there's me running back after the door as it's shutting, sliding in to get my foot in right before it closed. Um, spear phishing always comes from a trusted source. The attack against the Department of, of Defense individual worked because his job specifically was uh, working with surplus within the, the Defense Department and moving it out of the company. So it was a perfectly normal, trusted communication that someone say, this is what we want to buy. Do you have any tanks for sale? Um, it'll come from family. It'll come from a coworker. It'll come from friends. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have received an email, this is not spear phishing because it tends to be broad spectrum, but have any of you received the email that says, hi, I'm your friend, family member, or coworker, and I'm stuck out of the country, I just got robbed, I don't have my passport, can you please wire me some money? Um, yeah, yeah, so. Um, if you are an organization and you've got sensitive data, that attack works just fine. In fact, if you disguise it a little bit so it, you actually use proper English, don't sound Nigerian, you know, it has a much higher success rate. Um, uh, spear phishing tends to directly ask you questions. It'll ask you to either send information, it'll ask you to click on a link, it'll ask you to check out, hey, is this you in this video? Um, so let's talk about your businesses. Um, policies are a natural evil, and I spend a lot of my time writing policies for businesses now. Um, I do a lot of, uh, of ISO 27000 consulting. So um, there's really only three options for, for businesses today. We can either deny everything, sorry you're not allowed to use any social media outlet whatsoever. This doesn't work, and it doesn't make sense because that first premise, social media is vital to your business. We can allow everything, allow everyone to do anything they want to online. That tends to not work either because of uh, if everybody loses a half hour per day, um, people actually can keep track of that and tell you exactly how much that costs. I had an employee who uh, left actually on time from work from one company and I was called in to explain that either I was not making them clean their desk or I was allowing them to stop working five minutes early to clean their desk before they left. That was the only way they could leave on time and what it would cost if everybody in the company left early, five minutes, stopped working early to clean their desks. So trust me, people can calculate this. Um, or you can allow it and monitor the access and see what they do and give them guidance, give them education. Um, you can keep track of your own information space. What do you keep in your conference rooms? I love conference rooms. If I break into a company, I'm looking for your conference room. Why? Because it's where strangers go and look like they belong. I've been known to, to take out my little elf camera, take pictures of things in the conference room, and then when someone walks in, hold it against my ear like it's a cell phone and yell at the person that I'm on a private call, get the hell out. And that won't work anywhere else but a conference room. And people leave things in conference rooms. There are network jacks in conference rooms. There are corporate directories in conference rooms. What do you leave there? Yes, it is. Um, 
what do you keep on the website? Um, I actually had a, had a college that I, that, or a university that I penetrated, and I had one very sharp individual call human resources and report me. Did not trust me at all, no matter how charming I was. And because they actually had all their new hire paperwork online, I had actually had it all printed out. And so I was able to prove to HR, look, I'm, I'm a new employee. Here's all my paperwork. I'm going to bring this to you. By the way, I need to install a new virus update on your computer while I'm here. Can I do that? Um, the um, planning and event time frames. Uh, this is, this is, the idea here is when you say I'm going on a trip, when do you say that? Do you say that weeks in advance so that people know you're gone? Um, I like to say that the last day of my trip. Say, I'm coming home. Um, security <coughs> is essentially the people, the processes, and the technology. I'm gonna try to get through the rest of this. The idea of, of security is that we're free from danger. Um, who do you trust? We've already talked about that. Um, bring your own devices. Uh, this is a big thing in the industry right now. This is where uh, people want to use their own new latest generation phone, their latest tablet, and so on, uh, to work within the system. And it's usually driven by management. So when we do this, if we're going to work on these policies, we need to be able to retain the right to seize this equipment if there's ever a lawsuit or legal action and then give it to them. Consider creating a corporate app store for them. Um, I'm working backwards. Uh, let's talk about advanced persistent threats for just a moment. Um, all detection systems work if there are X number of events over Y amount of time, I can detect you. If you're, a, if you're a government entity or, or an organized crime or, uh, group, then chances are you've got the time and the ability to go very slow and be hard to detect. Um, there's a thesis out by a group in Australia that says that if you manage any kind of natural resource, oil, gas, water, anything, then odds are you are already the target of an, of an advanced persistent threat. Um, Best practices, um, I talked about ISO 27000. This is actual uh, a best practice that you can use in your organization. It's been tried, it's true, um, it works. There are free government resources. Um, check NIST, um, great resource. If anyone's interested in ISO 27000, it's 300 Swiss dollars if you wanna buy it from them or if you want a different title page, you can get it for 30 bucks from um, uh, from another group that I can tell you later. Um, the defense, I already covered this. It's education, it's vigilance. Um, the takeaways, um, never give your credentials to anyone. Don't send them an email. Don't give them to someone else. Don't let someone uh, kind and charming borrow your access card for just a few minutes. Um, don't access sensitive information from an unmanaged system, which could be an unpatched PC or another server. Uh, keep your tools up to date. Could be your software, could be a website, could be a skill set. Um, have processes in place for the execution of data. If I want you to, if I want a friend of mine to click on an e-card, my friends usually know, or I will tell them, hey, I sent you an e-card. I'll send them a text, I'll send them something else to say that it's done. Um, use different passwords or email identities. Check your privacy settings and your tools. I'm rushing through this because they're saying stop back there. Um, check where you send information. Um, yeah, I already covered that. Think before you post. And again, what stories do you tell? Think about that when you live online. And when in doubt, change your password. Thank you all very much.